Welcome, everyone. We um, are back with you again after a fantastic webinar that was so packed with uh, questions yep. that we had to return to um, bring you additional time to respond to them. So uh, I'm here with CK Curley, who graciously is spending more time with us to make sure all of your questions are addressed. Um, CK, are you ready to dive into the first couple of questions? I'm ready to dive in. And I also want to give credit to Margaret because um, she is spread very thin with all of the action points we have her on. So this takes extra time. So it shows extra commitment. But like she said, we needed to cover a lot of content and we didn't want to leave you hanging. So, Margaret, my gracious mate on all things webinars and Q&As, when you're ready, mm -hmm. hit me up. Excellent. The first couple of questions are um, around uh, Rutgers itself and what we're doing and how we're responding to the AI reskilling revolution. So I know you're very involved with the mini MBA in AI. So you, can you tell us what the plans are for 2024? Well, it's very exciting that we are launching a mini MBA around specifically AI, and it's covering so much. It's covering marketing, it's covering finance, it's covering ethics, it's covering best practices. I'm going to be focusing on how AI impacts the future of work with evolving our careers, our new AI coworkers and just company culture and new competencies. But we are currently finishing up our presentations. We are recording them. And I understand we are helping for a summer launch, but do stay tuned on that. So that is in the works and we are fervently working on that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And are you using AI content in, or addressing AI as content in any of your other mini MBA uh, presentations? I sure am. I'm actually doing um, a module. We call it a module. It's about three and a half hours specifically on AI and how that is a new marketing assistant for us. But I want to really speak to all of my colleagues in these in this program. AI is impacting every everything and everyone and all these opportunities and new challenges. So all the professors are integrating AI into their lessons. And I think it's important to say this, we are in technology, much like healthcare, much like the quest for truth in science and much like fashion, it never ends. In fact, that's what's so exhilarating about invent, reinvent, repeat behind me because we are always bringing new technologies in. So these are really living documents and living classes in that they are always maturing. And they're always something new. Yes, I agree. Many of our faculty are taking the opportunity to address AI in what they do and what their area of specialty is. So I think you'll be seeing that more and more mm -hmm. in uh, different mini MBA programs. Perfect. And um, another question was, what are universities, records in particular, doing about offering hard skill development in AI for professionals who are looking to change jobs? Well, Rutgers undergrad, I don't work with Rutgers undergrad, but insofar as undergraduate programs overall at Rutgers and graduate programs, in order to, to stay competitive, we too have to change. So we can't just talk about the change. We need to be changing ourselves. So whether it's hard skill development for AI, a lot around mach machine learning and data, because you need the data, data is the gas, AI is the engine, and soft skill development, these people skills that have been pushed to the side from all of this tech for the last 20 years are coming strong too. So you're going to see a lot more classes on that. And in existing classes across the sphere, you're going to be seeing AI come in just like digital did. Excellent. Yeah. There's a quote that I love from our Dean, Dean Lay, and um, I heard her say this uh, several times when speaking to uh, different groups of um, students, parents, uh, alumni, um, and she says that we are preparing our students for careers that don't even exist yet, and I think that really encompasses what you just said. Oh, it really underscores it because even the presentation we just did that you're able to go back and watch or watch for the first time, 
We are saying that 85% of job roles by 2030 haven't even been invented yet. Don't let that scare you. When you were a kid, did your grandma say you'd be a great mobile app developer? No. Or SEO coder? No. These are new jobs that we can reskill for and are evolving jobs that we can keep integrating tech. So I like what that Dean is saying. 85%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, we sort of touched on this question a little bit. How often does Rutgers change their classes to align with this mentality? And you really touched on that with uh, you every know, the semester, MBA. every time. These are living documents that we are constantly updating. And we're proud of that. And, and quite frankly, it's because we're really passionate about what we do. And we just have a culture here that we really, really work with our students. Whether our students are 18, I've reskilled all the way up to 80. Yep. Nice. You are not 80. You mean you're reskilling others? My students. I'm not 80 <laughs> yet. I'd be so proud of looking. But I'll tell you, funny thing, this is, we are in 2024. The web, the commercial part of the internet, internet started in the late 60s, but the web became commercialized. 30 years ago, this October. Oh, and I've been writing web one, web two, web three, and all this next gen technology. So I may be reskilling 80 year olds, but I am just hitting 55. And I got to tell you, I feel like I'm just still getting started because technology always makes things fresh and new. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. You know, within our own, um, programming, whether it's in executive education or in undergraduate, graduate, uh, postgraduate, sure. um, all the faculty members uh, indicate on their syllabus for their program exactly how they address AI in their classes now. So each person oh, wow. will get to see it used um, in different ways in different programs. Well so. done. Good, 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 good. Yep. Yeah, especially uh, referring to like generative uh, AI. Mm -hmm. So, but moving on, um, another question, uh, not so Rutgers focused, but about education in general. Mm. Do you think formal education is becoming moot because reskilling will move so quickly? Oh, I love this question. Not at all. I want you to think of formal education and formal education will have changes to it as well because of the new skills we need, both hard skills and people skills and just learning how learning agility and learning faster and more effectively at that. But formal education, no, that's a foundation. What is changing is that we don't just finish K through 12. We don't just finish undergrad. We don't just finish an MBA or a mini MBA. We are continually reskilling. So in this way, like I said in the in the webinar, reskilling is both a new, new normal. Continuous learning is how we need to go about life, our companies, heck, our communities and our, our countries, because things are moving so fast that we need to continue to reskill to stay up to date and so that it's not so overwhelming learning new skills. It's like when you get into that gym after that resolution, oof, it's hard going for the first month, but then you're exercising those muscles and it's starting to get a little easier to keep up with it. And then after six months, it becomes a habit. Yeah. Yes. And you can start adding new things into your routine, just like adding Absolutely. new skills. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, several more questions, if yes. you don't mind taking them about jobs. Yes. Ooh, the good Without ones. Without becoming a programmer, what job titles will we be uh, looking at that are AI skill heavy? So I'm going to say impacted by AI, and this is why. And the, the neat thing about generative AI, traditional AI is really pattern detection, Whereas generative AI creates patterns, it creates content, it creates music, it creates images. We don't need to be programming he heavy because it's not just low code, it's no code. What Margaret and I like to do is refer to the famous expression that I did not make up, that English is the hottest programming language natural processing around natural language. So we don't even need to be programming heavy for any of these tools. In fact, they're simple, they're easy, and they're affordable, uh, even to small nano businesses like me. But the question is, 
how do they impact different jobs? And you know what? Just like the mobile revolution, I would say mobile impacts 100% of industries. Why? Whether you're a bike courier, using your mobile phone to get directions or find out where your next project is, whether you're a farmer in the field and you need to check on the health of your crops or whether you are a business professional using mobile to check out the competition or how your customers are doing, it has impacted every single job. And it impacts us in different ways because it helps us do more of our job in the more human skills, better, faster, and easier. So it's actually going to impact all jobs and all industries, but that doesn't mean it replaces them, not at all. We're actually looking at more jobs being created. It just makes us work better and faster and more optimized at our jobs. And I know we have a few more questions on it, so I'll go in deeper as we go along with these good questions. Oh, fantastic. The next one was um, uh, a little bit of a deep dive into two specific areas. Yes. What are the uses of AI in finance and supply chain management? Oh, gracious. AI overall between finance and supply chain management, I will try and do well by you two industries. Everything from fraud detection to regulatory compliance to detecting new trends, supply chain. Actually, Starbucks uses a lot of AI to monitor its supply chain for inventory so it can allow its managers and baristas to spend more time doing what? Human to human interactions. Um, in finance, everything from making sure there's no fraud to robo trades, doing that automatically with trading stocks to helping us with our taxes. There's so, 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 so many. So the answer is a lot in a lot of different processes and a lot of different tasks. And that doesn't mean that finance professionals and supply chain management professionals go away. In fact, we need you more than ever. So we're just having help on the way there. Yeah, exactly. Um, another industry deep dive. What yeah. about education? What education jobs are going to be available? I'm going to speak to education, both from the standpoint of K to uh, through 12 teachers, as well as college professors, and a lot of reskilling in education, whether it's reskilling like we do at RBSEE or whether it's through training companies. And what would be thought of as, well, teachers will just go away because AI systems can handle it? Not at all. In fact, a lot more of these AI tutors and AI systems that personalize learning make it so that our students have help, whether it's K through 12 or whether I'm the student, have help with the areas that are difficult for them and can go faster in the areas where they're more proficient, which means that teacher is actually busier in his, her, and their job. So that's actually something we really haven't thought about as much, but we're seeing in some pilot studies, we're bringing AI into schools to help students is just making teachers do more of the work they love. Same thing happening with teachers at the graduate and um, undergraduate levels because they're continuing to change their courses and they're needing to work more with these systems and a lot more reskilling, whether inside corporations, inside training companies, associations, or like we do with reskilling with our certificate programs. So my answer yeah. is a lot. I'm sorry. I keep saying a lot, but I was going to say, of, I, I see a, a pattern. Yeah. I see a pattern here. Yep. Um, guilty. That's... Guilty as charged. <laughs> yep. Um, another question. Um, this one that says, uh, as a thought leader within a company, yes. but not a sole decision maker, how do you suggest providing realistic views on location flexibility within an organization? And this is a question that relates to one of the 10 strategies I spoke about in the webinar regarding being more flexible around location and more fluid on job titles. Because when you have a gazillion AIs, what becomes really precious are those millions of people that need to fill those roles. But one thing we need to understand is that not everyone 
lives near a major city or lives near in another country, lives near where that company does business. Now, some roles require that you're on site all the time, an emergency room, a police officer, all of these things. But some job roles, you only need to be there a couple times a week or maybe a couple times a year. So we need to be much more flexible as more and more of the demand grows for filling these roles in the way that we understand work to be. And we've gotten a lot of experience of that through the pandemic, but necessity is a mother invention. And a lot of companies are going to find as we keep um, going to 2030 and those massive jobs needing filled that we're going to be needing to be a lot more flexible on a lot more job roles that don't require being on site five days a week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see yeah. some uh, change still um, taking place there for sure. It'll be a permanent um, shift. It'll it'll be it'll be a little messy there. Revolutions are magical, but they're they're messy too. So, yeah. <laughs> um, our next question is about small business. Ooh, How wow. would AI impact um, small business culture? What cautions would you have for a small business owner in favor or against AI? Great. Um, so I'm the smallest business of all. I'm a nano business. My entire company is speaking to you right now um, and have been for 20 years. Real proud of that. Uh, a couple of things. The caution is always that it's not AI and then human. Human is always the manager, always in the loop, always overseeing these processes. It's not set it and forget it. So the biggest caution I have is going with this mentality that, oh, we have these AIs, we don't have to check on that anymore. Those tasks will change. You might go from doing as much writing to doing more editing. I can tell you right now, I have AI help me with writing, but I'm spending a lot more time editing and fact checking, okay? So the caution is no set it and forget it. The upside though, is being able to have more help on the areas where you may need some improvement or enhancement or areas that quite frankly, the robots are not taking our jobs, Margaret. We've been doing the damn robots job for way too long. Things that take up so much of our time as a small business, we need to get as much, if you're a big business too, out of our resources as possible. So there's a huge upside that's cost effective, okay? That is a more and more affordable. In fact, AI will never be more expensive than it is right now, generative AI. But also the caution is not set it and forget it. Humans are always in charge and keep humans in the loop. Yeah. You know, I think that you also just addressed one probably the biggest misconceptions that AI is a set it and forget it and is absolutely not. It never has been. My gracious, the responsibility we put on these poor robots. Thank God they're not sentient because it, it's really strange. And I think it's because we're equating intelligence too large, but I keep explaining to folks, intelligence equals the ability to acquire and apply skills to achieve an outcome. That's it. That is all it is. It's huge in its implications and its benefits, but it's not really even thinking. It's simulating thinking. It's working with us um, and it's reflecting back to us the data and the work we've done with it. So that is a huge misconception and a myth and a misinformation that needs to be put to rest completely. Yeah. Yes. All right, our next several questions revolve around skills. Um, so our first one says, can you please define skills based on AI? Well, so AI skills um, are gonna come, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna couple this with another question we have and another way that I go about it. I'm going to put AI into three buckets. It's gonna be very helpful. One assisting us. It assists us and it helps us with the task. When I'm getting in my car and I'm using GPS, I'm telling it where I want to go. It's telling me the best route to get there at that time. Okay. So it is assisting us. A smartphone assists us with communications and the like. So any kind of skills 
these tools can better assist us. The second bucket is augmenting. Augmenting is when it enhances or improves a skill. Um, writing a press release, writing a speech overview, creating graphics for a certain campaign. Heck, if I'm a creative director and I'm using Adobe's Firefly and all those production tools and I'm using generative fill because it's an easier way to crop and improve images. That's literally improving and enhancing my work. Back to assist, when a surgeon uses certain tools to help he or she do that surgery, that's assisting them. And then there's all out automation. An autonomous car would be all out automation, taking care of an entire task for you. Or if I'm using an AI tool that will schedule meetings for me, that is automating a specific task. So when we talk about AI skills, they usually can um, fall into one or three of those buckets. And usually we find that generative AI is really in the middle with augmentation, which always takes humans because it's improving and enhancing and working with you as kind of a new kind of coworker. Sometimes people say intern and the like. So AI skills can fall into those three buckets, but AI skills are contingent and dependent upon every single job role and different industry. What I think is sometimes hard to understand is it's not just that we're going to learn how to use these tools, like learning how to use a better prompt for chat GPT or learning how to get better images out of a tool like MidJourney and the like. What we're actually going to do is look at our jobs as they exist right now and say, where could these tools, because there's a lot of tools, help me with assisting, help me with enhancing or improving, or where could I automate a task so I can better spend my time and my talents elsewhere? So it's going to be like that for every single job role, which will really make us take a step back and say, you know what? I haven't been afforded the ability to look at what I do best and what I spend my time on. So it's really going to be AI skills in one of those three buckets and like I said before, now that we have a lot of technology helping us with the tech stuff and the hard skills, we're going to need to be working on our soft skills and our interpersonal skills, leadership, collaboration, adaptability, curiosity, and the like. So it's a big yeah. answer, but I think that takes care of a, a, a few questions in this area because it it's is such an important area, but it's going to depend. So where I was saying before the word a lot, you're going to hear me say, it depends a lot because it does depend. Yeah. Well, that definitely addresses uh, several questions. One of them uh, quote, had quoted you specifically those uh, three A's um, from, from the webinar. So I'll skip ahead to the question about where is the best place to find um, self-taught skills for AI integration? Oh, gracious. So we are lucky that we are I got to tell you, Margaret, myself, and my colleagues, 12 years ago, we were one of the only kids on the blocks for reskilling. They were like, these mini MBAs, what do they mean? Are they just online or are they just on site? It was a new area. Um, but now, because of so much tech, so much change, and the pandemic, and getting more comfortable with online, there are so many places that we can find different skilling programs. Of course, I'm partial to what we're doing at Rutgers, but we also have things like this very webinar. We have a ton of podcasts. Heck, when I'm watching TikToks, a lot of the time I'm watching it from different thought leaders and what they think about AI. We have great new initiatives like the AI Exchange. LinkedIn has learning. Gracious, every single university comes out with their certificate programs. And what's really interesting is a lot of free programs from the likes of Google, IBM, Cisco, all of them. You'd almost think that was a really good strategy on their part to start reskilling prospects before they hope they come back to their companies. In fact, it is. Google looks at some of its certificates with the same weight and gravity as it looks at four-year degrees. 
because skills are the new currency. They do not render any degrees moot, but we're in a time where we have to keep reskilling to keep ourselves really high advantage. So books, audio books, podcast, webinars, um, single courses, uh, courses that go over a few months. It takes a little research and it takes a little research because it may be contingent upon, are you a project manager? Are you a marketer? Are you a supply chain manager? So you're needing to look at what your job role is and what your industry is. But you know what? Something tells me, a little birdie tells me that you might be able to use one of these LLM chatbots and say, search the internet to find all of these different programs. And a really big area is to start asking your colleagues and at conferences and finding out there. So that answer is a lot and everywhere, but we're lucky for that. What will be hard for us is not finding programs, it's finding the right program for us. Yeah. Um, I know we were generally speaking about reskilling, but there's mm -hmm. a question here about K-12. And I think that's sort of where, you know, the skills are created, not re, you know, recreated. So um, any ideas around what some ways K-12 education can begin to foster these skills yes. um, in uh, their districts? So there's some questions on bringing these skills into K through 12, and there's some concerns about, well, there's three things. And there's questions about bringing them into K through 12, which we need to bring digital into K through 12, because guess what? Using AIs and LLM chatbots today is like using Google, kind of like yesterday or two years ago, right? And so we need these skills, but there's also concerns on two sides. One is, what about plagiarism? What if kids could cheat on their homework? Understandably so. And these are very valid concerns. Um, two things there. One, I I really advocate for flipping the business model and a lot of education and making the lecture the homework and the homework happen in class when we all need the most help. We have questions. We're in teams. The teachers are present. And if we even used LLMs or didn't use, that way we're overseeing it so that we stave off plagiarism and the like. Also, many more tools getting much more sophisticated where we can find out if, in fact, those kids have plagiarized anything. We're seeing a lot of this in the news right now. And we're seeing new tools. So look for improvements there and look for them to happen quite quickly because a revenue model is associated with that. But another question is, parents are saying, I want to make sure that my kids are using these AI tools so that they're ready for the workforce. And a lot of times that can happen in their community or it can happen at home with the parents because of the reskilling that we just talked about with the last question and things like Khan Academy is doing. It's so wonderful. They're having AI assistance to help with homework. It doesn't do homework for the kid. It shows where we might be having problems, you know, solving algebra problems and areas of strengths as well. So it can come from the parents in the community, even if it's not yet coming from the schools. But I do think we'll see a lot of change there. But kind of like we did extracurricular activities when we were a kid, you know, some of those activities might have been, you know, physical sports, but some might have been fine arts. Why can't some of our, our activities be around technology and learning? Kids are loving to code and they're getting so creative. So a lot of good stuff there. We just need to be mindful of it. Yeah. And what's available. Oh, that's great. I'm going to uh, move on to a slightly different topic cool. um, around uh, return on investment. So Ooh. how can you measure ROI? Um, to gain necessary investment? Well, when it comes to generative AI, what's beautiful about these tools is that they're much easier to use than those tools, grandfathers over in traditional AI, which are still very important, but they take a bigger learning curve in that we can just type in you know, regular English or any other language to find out what we need or how it can improve us. But the benefits are pretty darn immediate. In 60 seconds or less, 
you have a great output that you need to work with because you don't set it and forget it, like I said earlier, but you have a result there. So what you're hearing from everyone is, oh my God, the time saved or where this can help me, or is I don't need to rely on my assist when it's her, you know, her day off, I can actually use these systems and still be productive. So the productivity alone, that's showing a lot of, a lot of ROI also in what's generated and what all we can generate and where we can move people's time to doing more of the tough stuff that uniquely skilled humans can do. So that productivity, it's really being called productivity's next frontier. What's happening is that given the enterprises that and companies and small businesses that are integrating it are having such an advantage over those that don't. So just the productivity alone means a, a, a ton of ROI. And we're being able to recognize that ROI much more quickly because the benefit's are so immediate. It's not like six, nine months or a year out like it was with brethren traditional AI systems. Yeah. So it's probably easy to convince a boss um, uh, or a budget like manager to say or easy. something to, to I'd like uh, to say easy. invest. I love your idea of liking to say easy. It may not be easy to say, will we invest? But what is easier is, can we do a pilot on this being that it will only cost us a few hundred, not tens of thousands to do this pilot and or if we want to integrate our own data or why don't we just get a, the, the world has gone subscription model, right? Why don't we just do a subscription model and if we if we need to opt out of it, we'll opt out of it. So it's a lot easier being that the barriers to entry, the simplicity to learn and the cost are down. I just don't want to promise everyone that every boss is easy, but I hope they're easy. Yeah. And open. I hope they're so open. Yeah. So um, the next question is a little long, but I think um, the bottom line of it is um, that they'd like to know if you think the value um, of AI has been achieved yet, or if there's still um, oh, more okay. to go. So it's hard to believe that we, because AI technically has been around since 1940s, 50s. So we've been at this many decades, but, and bless our, our forefathers in this, who waited through many AI winters and many decades because we had to have processing. We had to have data. We had to have other technologies like GPS and, and better computers and all of this come together to create what we're seeing. And it's changed so much and accelerated so much in but a year, year and a half, um, that it's hard to believe, folks, we are still at the very beginning of this mega invention. And this is probably the best way for me to explain it. There will be more change to, write this down, hold me to it, the World Wide Web over the next five years than there has from the past 30 years. Why? Because we have AI, because we have all this immersive media, because we use conversation and natural language. Heck, I'm using wearable and I just gesture or gesture, I cannot say that correctly, gestural, gesture. <laughs> yes, gestural <laughs> technology to be able to have this work. I'm telling everyone, your microwave's gonna become more difficult than your technology to put an input and an output in. So we are going so far over the next five years because what took the past 30 years. But even that, we're still at the very beginning of these mega inventions. So there has been ROI achieved and there have been fits and start, starts and explosions and lulls. And we've seen a lot happen in the last 12 to 18 months. But I'd say overall with AI, we really ain't seen nothing yet. We ain't seen nothing yet because we are just starting to integrate these tools into many more jobs. And I'm still talking to a lot of audiences that are at the very, very beginning and haven't started integrating. So ROI is going to be a longer conversation, um, but it is more immediate with these tools. Yeah. 
Excellent. And mm -hmm. speaking of tools, the next question happens to be about yeah. that. There are so many AI tools out there. Do okay. you have any top recommendations? So this would depend upon your role. So for example, if you were a creative, I'd be saying, look at image creation systems like uh, a mid journey, like what Adobe has wrapped in and like um, what chat GPT is doing now. If you are working more in language, I'd say, look at the LLMs. If you have more operational or administrative work, I'd say, look at note taking apps, look at transcription apps. If you're working with more of a global audience, I would look at language apps and the like. So it really depends on each and every one of us. But I would say this, get comfortable with some of these LLM chatbots, whether it's a chat GPT, whether it's a Google Gemini, whether it's, you know, Claude Anthropic, start tinkering around with that. And then start to look at your day and say, where could a tool really help me? Note-taking has helped me. I actually find some of these tools that will give you quizzes help me with research and the like. So it really depends. And I know there's so many and I know it's overwhelming. So the best thing is to look at your day, look at your pain points and look at your tasks and say, where could an AI tool assist or augment or even automate something for me and then do some searches for different tools? Yeah, because there's there's just thousands, if not tens of thousands already. Nice. Yeah. Um, our next several questions um, are about validating AI outputs. Yes. So here's the first one. How important will it be to validate the output of a generated AI? It will be essential and extremely important, mm -hmm. and it will be important to validate and oversee any output from any AI. An AI is only as good as the data it's trained on. Um, An AI is only as good as the mentor and coach, you, that are working with it. And while AIs may take time away from writing a lot, like I said, I'm doing more editing. I'm doing more fact checking and the like. So it's essential. Underscore red circle around that highlight. Nice. Um, uh, just a, a personal anecdote here. A friend was telling me that one of the online dedicated stylists is actually AI and Ooh. they're getting their feedback by, you know, that you, you spend a certain amount of month and they send you uh, clothes that they recommend what you keep. They know you like what you send back. They know you didn't. And that that's the feedback loop there. You know, they're tremendously popular. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. they're always on, they always remember what you need, um, and they're constantly searching. That does not mean it's going to replace people, but it does mean this. These tools are able to serve us, right? And as long as we're checking the output, what we like, working with them, overseeing human in the loop, they continue to serve us. When we set it and forget it, then we're to blame because these are intelligent, but they're not intelligence like us. It's an alternative intelligence. But yeah, yeah it's cool. It's a cool tool. I've used it. Yeah. Um, next one is um, where are we in trusting the output as is? And will that change over time? And I think we sort of uh, touched on that just now. We touched on it. It's actually having to get improved. Sources, attribution, making sure we're not using data that we weren't allowed to use. Like we have a, a big important lawsuit right now, New York Times um, against GPT, and what constitutes that out. But it will always be important. We'll always have humans in the loop. Our, our data will get better. Our standards will, will get better. I just saw something come out this morning that we're going to get the equivalent of a good housekeeping seal for different tools that remain good actors, committed to improving, set the standards in ethics. So there's going to be a lot of heat on this and in a good way, right? And a lot of attention, but never ever set it and forget it and never take humans out of the loop. Nope, 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 nope. 
Isn't that well, good to that, hear? Y'all are going to be working full time for a long time. <laughs> full yeah. time plus, right? Yeah. Um, but not only is it good to hear, but it is the perfect segue to this next question, oh my gosh, which okay. is what skills are needed to validate a generated AI output? Well, um, several. So um, fact checkers, are. it's very important for that. Editing, that's very important. And expertise in your job role and industry. So again, where humans think they're going to be doing less work, they're going to be doing an elevated different kind of work and they'll work in different ways, online, on-site, hybrid models. Um, but this is going to continue to be essential that we fact check, that we source, right? And that we have the expertise of our industries and our jobs. Oh, perfect. So um, our last couple of questions, um, okay. kind of um, uh, gathered them in what I'll call concerns. So yeah. first being, should we be concerned about plagiarism with AI helping with academic or other help with document creation? 100%. Um, and it's not just with academic. It's like the lawsuit that I just referenced. So we need to make sure that everything is properly sourced, that the data that these models and that we're feeding to these models um, is accurate, um, is allowed. You know, we're not giving company secrets or, or breaching privacy. So it is extremely important. And that is a major concern. Also misinformation, misinformation and disinformation are huge. Those are, those are pretty much my two biggest concerns right now is that, oh, it's easy to get the wrong thing out there and it goes around the world before you've even been able to see that it's happening. Um, also AI bias. I hate that term because the computers aren't biased, humans are, and we fed that into them. So I, I don't want us to shirk accountability and call them bias. That is a big area under ethics and also just the integrity of the data. So that concern is huge. And that objective um, is something that is getting a lot of focus right now and fairly so, because those need massive improvement. Yeah. Um. Next question. Yes. Wouldn't you agree that though? Oh, I'm going to read this as it's. Um, That's okay. Bring it as on. it's stated. Make sure that. Um, uh, wouldn't you agree though? Oh, here's this is it. I I transposed their words. Wouldn't you agree though that there will be an outsized impact on certain portions of the population, such as those with disabilities? I absolutely agree. Here's the thing, outsized impact could be negative or could be positive. Um, we have too big of both a digital divide and an overall opportunity divide when it comes to overall, but when it comes to so much technology. Um, so what we don't want to happen is that AI, being the massive technology it is, making that prosperity gap and that opportunity gap larger. However, let's flip it. The outsized positive impact just to accessibility alone. Folks, we have GPS. We have too many folks with vision and motor problems that cannot read the world like we are able to. We have different languages. We have um, hearing impaired and deaf audiences that gain a lot through the accessibility that AI affords us. So that's one. Two, I just went over the massive reskilling revolution and the huge talent gap that could equate to what, Margaret? the size of Germany's population of 85 million unfilled jobs. We can't create humans fast enough. What we need to stop doing, and this is what I'm hoping that AI does, and I'm gonna be working on some efforts here, is look at audiences that have been untapped and overlooked and marginalized before. I'm gonna name quite a few. Those with disabilities. I like to say different abilities. I, I just don't like that word. Refugees, minorities, veterans, oh my gracious, so many different groups that we have not served well, 
but AI makes it simpler to learn, like I talked about before, an immediate benefit, more accessible, and more companies will need more talent, no matter where they're located. It can be developing nations as well. So it can be all these different groups that were elder populations coming back into the workforce part-time. I mean, gracious, I probably won't stop working until I'm 85 because I love this stuff. Folks, this is the outsized impact on the positive side. So we're seeing a lot of challenges from companies that they don't know just how much they're going to need to start tapping these audiences. But I don't want to eschew the possibility and could be likely ability to make that digital divide larger. So that is that is so imperative. Yeah. Great. Good question. And Thank you for bringing that up. That's a that's really a labor of love, the working with those audiences. So, yeah. Yeah, so yes, for me too, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, Veterans, yeah. So um, I'm going to close with this question because of one part of it that I think is the way we should summarize. Okay. Um, the AI generates sometimes very dry and not very personalized material for this yes. person um, wow. when they seek uh, support writing uh, blogs and press releases. Um, and they ask, can we make AI get better? You know what? Start using, this is a really good, good question. Start using a better tool for your efforts. And this is what I mean. It's not just using one of the existing LLMs, large language models, but we have systems like Jasper, and HubSpot, where you can, for a subscription model that is affordable, put a lot of your writing style, and it won't be shared with others, into that system, and it can work to know you and what type of metaphors you like, what kind of sentence structures you like. So if you're not already using a tool like that, this is great for brand marketers too. And I went to these and I was like, they're not going to be affordable. I'm telling you they're affordable. I was really, really impressed. We just need to use better tools for that because it could be very dry language because the, again, they're only as good as the data they're trained on. So let's start training them on data models that we love that for. I hope that person hears this and gets back to me with some, some um, updates because I think that will be really, really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I yes. need, uh, just need better tools. Yeah. And there are so many existing out there that can work with our own data. Um, so we need to need to keep that in mind. Yeah. So um, CK, that um, is the extent of the additional questions, the ones we were, okay. we were unable to address. <laughs> um, and uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the extra time that you've spent addressing those. Our because time. literally. You too. Literally, Our time. I know, but we, um, we spent at least as much time on questions as we did on the content in this case. And let me tell you, this will come as no surprise to nobody, but I'm long-winded. So my content was long. It was good, but it was long. So I do hope these were helpful. I know a lot of answers are, it depends. It's customized to you. It can be in different buckets of assisting and augmenting and automating, but that should also give you a lot of optimism that oddly, I'm making everyone optimistic. You've got a lot of work don't worry for a lot more years. Um, so you probably will come back to me griping that you don't have more free time, but we'll get to work at the top of our talents. And most important, we keep learning and we keep reinventing. Invent, reinvent, repeat, because it's a skills-based economy. And that is on top of our foundational undergrad and graduate degrees. And that just makes technology work for us in our jobs and bigger paychecks. So- over to you, Margaret. Thank you Excellent. for your time. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for your time. Thank our audience um, yes. who came up with these fantastic questions. And uh, CK, I know we'll see you again in upcoming mini MBA programs. And I hope to have you on another uh, webinar um, for it's the next, uh, you know, the next topic that we come up with for addressing uh, AI. I so, know, and everything, yeah. I know, I know. Well, thank you so much, and we'll thank see you, you next time. Okay, great. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.